Good morning, Auto 2. We're going to be talking today about comparing different types of fuels, um, and we'll give you a criteria by which we'll compare them. So first, we want to think about BTU content. BTU content is British thermal content. That's a measure of the heat that it takes to raise one pound of water one degree Fahrenheit. So we'll say this fuel has so many BTUs. That's its capacity to make heat, and you'll understand as we go along here. Our second criteria is volatility. Volatility is our ease of vaporization. How easily does this go from a liquid to a vapor, um, which helps obviously in burning. Then the octane rating. Octane is the fuel's resistance to burning. And when we have high compression or high heat, we want a fuel that's more resistant to burning. Um, a higher octane isn't always better and a lower octane isn't always worse, but um, we do want to look at the octane rating and we have some criteria by which we decide which octane rating to use. Um, it has to do with temperature, altitude, load on the vehicle, compression ratio, things like that. Um, this website, which is alternative fuels, etc., which is a government one, gives a comparison of different types of fuels and it's a really good website for you to look at if you're interested in different types of fuels and, and how they work and how we look at them and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so octane requirements is those factors that tell us what octane we should be running. And so the OEM, which is the manufacturer of the car, original equipment manufacturer, they are going to recommend octane rating in the engine uh, um, owner's manual, sorry, in for an engine in the owner's manual. Um, octane much, must match compression ratio. So if you have a 8.5 to 1 or 9 to 1 engine, you're most likely going to be recommended 87 octane. Um, if you have a 9.5 or 10 to 1, you're going to have to run uh, 89 or maybe even 91, but your owner's manual will recommend that. Um, high compression ratios, typically uh, more performancey cars, and turbocharging, which builds cylinder pressure, is going to require more octane. And um, and again, there's some other factors, but all else being considered, high compression needs higher octane fuel. So let's talk about gasoline. So gasoline has a really high BTU content, approximately 113,000 BTUs per gallon. That would be its energy content at sea level, because as you go up, it loses energy uh, where there's less oxygen. Um, but it gives about 113,000. It takes about 22,000 BTUs to produce a gallon of gasoline. So you have a significant net energy gain. You you spend 22,000 BTUs in, in taking the oil and converting it into gasoline, but you produce 113,000 BTUs per gallon. Um, here's our octane ratings at sea level that we have, 87, 89, and 91. Here's our octane levels if you go into the Rockies in Colorado, 84, 86, and 91, because we don't need as high an octane uh, when there's less oxygen as you go up in altitude. Um, everybody buys 87 because it's cheapest and because that's what Costco has. Mr. L is always going to tell you that almost every passenger car really should be running 89 octane. Cars will run a little bit better. They'll get a little more performance, etc. with 89. You don't need 91 unless you have higher compression or really high load or uh, high heat or things like that. Okay. Um, so gasoline additives. So tetraethyl lead used to be a chemical we put in gasoline to raise the octane rating. It was a, a significant pollutant, so we removed it years and years ago in the mid-70s. So now we use what we call oxygenates, different types of alcohols. Uh, alcohols, toluene, ethanol, and we used to use MTB, which is methyl, tertiary, butyl, ether. We don't use this anymore because we found it was getting into the water table and was harmful to the, our health. But we use oxygenates, things that will uh, oxygenate the fuel to help raise its octane level. One of the consequences of running alcohols in fuels, it's really hard on rubber lines. They tend to dry out and crack and they eventually start leaking. So all automotive manufacturers have gone to synthetic um, plastic lines or stainless or, or galvanized steel uh, fuel lines. Diesel has a higher B2 content than gasoline. It has about 140 to 141,000 BTUs per gallon. So it's got like 20 to 25% more energy in a gallon of diesel than a gallon of gasoline. Hence, they make more power. It's more typically low speed pulling power. That's not always true unless you, if you got a twin turbocharged Mercedes or something. 
but a, a gallon of diesel is about 114,000 BTUs. Higher octane, much much higher octane. We use a rating, we call it a cetane number in diesel, but it's way more resistant to burning than gasoline. Um, the cetane number um, for diesel one and two is about our, uh, about 40. Um, you can't really compare it to gasoline because they're different types of fuels. This is a much more oily uh, fuel, but it is, um, it does have a very high octane rating. Um, it is lower volatility. So it doesn't, it's not very volatile. It doesn't burn as easily. So therefore it requires a much higher compression. So whereas a gasoline engine will run nine to one or 10 to one, a diesel engine will run 20 to one or 22 to one. Um, we have to have heavy duty components because of all the pressure of that high compression ratio. And typically we'll have three or even four compression rings as opposed to two on a gasoline piston. So um, let's pause for a sec. So next we want to talk about different types of fuels other than gasoline and diesel. So an alternative fuel is any other fuel than gas and diesel. And here's some examples. Uh, LPG, which is liquefied petroleum gas, a byproduct of oil. Alcohol, um, which usually like methanol alcohol or ethanol alcohol are made from uh, vegetable products. Um, hydrogen, which is gotten through a principle uh, a process of electrolysis of water and compressed natural gas, which is very abundant in North America, comes out of the ground. Um, so let's talk about some of these. So first, um, LPG, which is one of the lightest fractions of crude oil. So in that uh, fractioning tower would be way up at the top. It burns extremely clean. It's, it's similar to gasoline, but at ambient uh, pressures, uh, sorry, ambient um, outside temperature and pressure, it is a gas. It's not a liquid, whereas gasoline is a liquid. Um, we use it in industrial equipment and fleet vehicles, um, for example, indoor forklifts, and we'll use it in there because um, uh, it burns really clean and its uh, pollutants are not nearly as bad as gasoline. Um, again, burns clean with low emissions. Uh, it, it is a vapor. Um, it, at room temperature and pressure. So that makes it tough to store much of it. We have to compress it to a real high pressure to be able to get it into a liquefied state so we can store any kind of quantity of it. Um, so again, it's gotta be stored under pressure and that's a little scary. Um, makes it a little harder to, to fill and so on. Um, it has about 91,000 BTUs per gallon. So significantly less energy in that uh, gallon of, uh, of LPG compared to gasoline and we call it propane or butane. So we can cook with it and we can power vehicles with it. So if you live way out in Montana in the boonies, you can get a big tank of it once a month and you can heat your house, you can cook with it, you can power your vehicles, etc. To put propane um, on a vehicle, it, you have to make some changes to the engine. Um, typically aren't that bad. I don't know about a brand new vehicle, um, but uh, for an older vehicle, it wasn't that hard. When you have a flexible fuel vehicle, that you can't use propane in there. Um, a FFV vehicle is allows you to run ethanol alcohol or, or what we call E85 in the Midwest. So a flexible fuel vehicle can't run propane. We've got to make some different changes to be able to do that. So this just shows LPG. It has something that looks like a carburetor. We've got a high pressure tank. Um, we've got a fuel strainer and a fuel sock and some sort of a converter that lets us go from liquid to gas. So it's going to be a restriction and this is going to go in as a vapor. Um, it just gives you kind of an idea of a really, really simple system. So next let's talk about alcohol fuels. So there's basically two types of alcohol used and the first is ethanol alcohol or ethyl alcohol, but we call it ethanol. And we usually make this from wheat or sugar cane, potatoes, fruit, oats, soybeans, or corn. In the U S we typically make it out of corn. In Brazil, they make it mostly out of sugar cane. Sugar cane has um, more alcohol in it. You tend to get more energy out of the sugar cane than you do the corn. But look at this. It takes 98,000 BTUs to produce one gallon that contains 76,000 BTUs. And that was a Cornell University study, so it's not a biased limb kill thing. Um, meaning there's a net energy loss. Now, this is when you're making ethanol which we call E85 in the Midwest, which is 85% ethanol alcohol from corn and 15% gasoline. So you're saying, Mr. L, why would anybody produce it when there's a net energy loss? It's simple. The federal government um, uh, basically gives 
um, money to manufacturers of corn to get them to sell them to ethanol producers. So, so it's it, because the government's involved, they can make money, but there is a net energy lost. And the correct word, and sorry to slip me there for a moment, is the this is subsidized by the government, so it doesn't it can't operate on its own. If we let the free market work here, people aren't going to burn ethanol because they can't make money producing it and selling it. Um, methyl alcohol or methanol, which is made from wood chips and garbage, even worse, it has about 56,800 BTUs per gallon. So we have a huge net energy loss. We have to burn a lot more fuel to do this. So gasoline is starting to look like pretty cool stuff. One of the advantages of both of these fuels is that they're less polluting, less hydrocarbons um, out the tailpipe. Um, so again, alcohol fuels are cleaner burning for automobiles. Uh, you do have to make fuel system modifications to use alcohol. So we have to have what's called an FF fuel, a flexible fuel uh, vehicle. And um, they can be very corrosive. So like I said, they, well, I didn't say corrosive. I said that they would dry out and crack rubber fuel lines, but they're also very, very corrosive. So uh, top alcohol dragster, after they go down the track, they run methanol alcohol. They have to come back and flush the lines out immediately because it will um, definitely corrode metals like aluminum, etc., and steel, unless it's stainless. Almost twice as much alcohol must be burned compared to gasoline. So you have a tremendous amount of fuel that you've got to use to get as much work done. It's cleaner on the environment. It's got real high octane, so it's good in a lot of cases. If you don't care about how, the quantity you burn in terms of cost, it's a great fuel. But obviously, otherwise, for most of us, we do care about the money we spend on the quantity of fuel that we burn. Gasohol was something in the 70s and 80s, which was a mix of, uh, this was, uh, I believe, 80 or 90% gasoline, 10% alcohol, okay? Um, you won't hear about this anymore. Fuel system modifications weren't needed. These days, in the summertime, we go to an oxygenated alcohol type blend to help with emissions during the summer. I don't know what the percentage is, but it was probably pretty close to this. Um, alcohol also increases anti-knock qualities because it has higher octane. It resists detonation, which is what we call anti-knock qualities. So this showing that we got incredible graphic. I know you need this 90%, 10%, 100% gas oil. Okay. Um, and it says 10% alcohol can increase the needs of an octane to about 91. So that's a real advantage. Um, but again, it has less energy than straight gasoline, which is a problem. Hydrogen is a highly flammable gas that does make energy, and we can produce it through electrolysis of water, sending electric current through salt water. But the problem with that is it costs us electrical energy. Granted, you could make your electricity by um, solar or other methods, but we have to use electricity acting on salt water to actually make hydrogen. It burns extremely clean, leaving only water and carbon dioxide as byproducts. And I know that you know, we're talking about carbon dioxide, uh, CO2 as a greenhouse gas, and that not being so advantageous to the environment. But in the automotive field, we, we don't want to produce hydrocarbons and carbon monoxide, which we know are de definitely harmful. So we look at a fuel as clean burning if it produces lots of carbon dioxide. If we want to get rid of carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas, we've got to get off fossil fuels, plain and simple. No other two ways about it. It's expensive to make and to store because it has to be stored under high pressure in order to be a liquid at ambient temperature and pressure. One gallon has only 35,280 BTUs, and the cost of electrolysis of one gallon is two to three times that of natural gas. So it's a huge net energy loss, and this is why nobody is using hydrogen. Um, I mean, there is a uh, there are some hydrogen um, concept cars out there. But the energy loss is so great, it's too expensive at this point. And they're just showing you use electricity on water to actually create the hydrogen. Compressed natural gas is very similar to diesel, but it has a lower amount of BTUs. It's very clean burning, about 99% carbon, uh, carbon monoxide, 85% less HC. It has very, very high octane, so it works really well in, in uh, high compression engines. And it's... Um, we have to store it under high pressure, and so we have to have very large tanks. Um, the school district had CNG buses, and they got such poor fuel economy that they stopped rating them in miles per gallon and started rating them in gallons of co consumed per hour. Okay, So it's a really abundant in North America, so it's not expensive, 
but it has a bunch of problems. We just don't have a lot of energy, and so we have to have a huge tank and burn a ton of it. Um, it's very difficult to fill the tank because of the high pressure uh, filling process. And 900 BTUs per cubic feet, or 6,700 BTUs per gallon. So remember, gasoline had about 114,000 BTUs per gallon. So you can see there's way less energy in a gallon of, of, um, of natural gas. So anyways, so there's a little bit about comparing different types of fuels. And you can see why uh, gasoline and diesel just aren't going away anytime soon. Um, we haven't talked about electric cars, but our, our limitations on electric cars right now are how we make the electricity, and that's our big issue, and also battery storage and, and what kind of range we can get with an electric car.